today we are going to take a little detour. Uh, we will finish up our study in Malachi next week. Uh, today, being um, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I thought it would be appropriate if we were to actually talk about being grateful, gratitude, and thankfulness uh, in life. So, this week we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. Hopefully, um, all y'all got somewhere you're going to be. Uh, if not, we can find you somewhere. I'm sure there's someone's got a spare chair somewhere. We can find somewhere to stick you. Just let me know. Um, it's interesting is the idea of being thankful. Right? The, the idea that, that there's gratitude, that, that there are good things and blessings in your life and that you were expressing thankfulness for them. Whenever you look at what it means to give thanks, when you look at what it means to be grateful, the, the definition according to Merriam-Webster of thankfulness is being conscious of benefits that have been received. So you have benefited, you have received benefit, and now you are conscious of that going, wow, I, I received that benefit. And so you are thankful for that. However, in Thanksgiving, it's not just that you notice, hey, good things happened to me, but you're giving thanks. It's actually being directed. It's not merely expressed that, hey, I like this. I'm glad things are good in my life. No, no, what it is is that you're expressing gratitude towards someone. Thankfulness is given. Gratitude has an object. Whenever someone says, I'm thankful, there has to be to whom you cannot, it is impossible to just be thankful, just thankful. What that really means is, I like it. But whenever someone says, oh, I'm thankful for that, thankful to whom? Oh, no one in particular, I'm just thankful. No, that, well, all you're saying is, I like this. But thankfulness, gratitude has to be directed to someone. You recognize that there is a benefit, a blessing, a good thing in your life that you have received that came from someone and you were directing thankfulness to them. That is what thanksgiving is all about. That we are thankful for the good things we have received and we are directing that thankfulness towards the one they came from. But upon a deeper reflection on what it means to be thankful and the importance of having an attitude and a heart that is thankful for the good things in our life. One of the biggest things that is going on in today's society, in today's culture, is that there are so many people who seem cast about without meaning, without purpose, unsatisfied, discontent in their life. And part of that is because you cannot be satisfied without being thankful. Gratitude, thankfulness, is actually one of the keys to satisfaction in life. Let's take a look in Philippians chapter 4. This is Paul addressing the Philippians, and he's telling them in verses 8 and 9, Brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things, that is, think about these things, dwell on these things, consider, like actually let them occupy your mind and really consider these good, wonderful things that are in your life. Verse 9, these things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. Paul tells them this right before he makes a point that he has learned how to be content in everything. In all situations. Verse 11, he says, Not that I speak with regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Do, do you have that? That no matter what comes your way, whatever situation is in life, that you're okay. That you can be content, you can be satisfied. Well, that would be great to have, amen? Well, Paul said he had it. Let's look at what he says. Verse 12, I know how to be abased or poor, and I know how to be wealthy. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
And what is it that has made it possible for him to be content in all these situations? Whether hungry or well-fed, rather poor or whatever situation he finds himself in. He answers it in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is able to be content because he is thankful for the greatest gift he has ever received, and that is the grace of Jesus Christ. See, if you want to live a life of satisfaction, you have to be thankful. That requires that you recognize there are good things in your life. There are, there absolutely are. No matter how hard things may appear, no matter how much pain you may endure, there are good things in life. So you recognize the good things, but then you also recognize who they came from. In order to be thankful, it's not just an expression that I like this. Remember, it is targeted towards the one who gave you those good things. In James chapter 1, verse 17, he says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. So you realize there are good things in life. And sometimes... Yes, we live in this fallen and broken and sinful world and there is hurt and there is pain and sometimes the goodness that we have to look to may seem small or petty in other circumstances, but we can still look and see that good. There's all kinds of wonderful small little things in life. I think so often we get so busy, right? As the um, wise man once said, Life moves pretty fast. If you don't slow down every once in a while, you just might miss it. Sometimes we need to slow down to smell the roses. You realize God didn't have to make roses smell good? He didn't have to do that. But he did. You can enjoy them. And I've talked about this one because we're Baptists, but food. God didn't have to make food taste good. right? I, I mean, you'll eat, I remember... Um, whenever my oldest was a baby and we were struggling immensely to get her to take her bottle and she wasn't one to eat and we're at the doctor for some checkup and we brought it up, we're like, she's, you know, we're, 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 she's fighting it, she's not wanting the bottle. And the doctor said, she gets hungry, she'll eat. Because we'll, we'll eat, we're hungry, our body knows we need it. Whether we want it or like it or not, we'll eat it because we're hungry and it's there. God didn't have to make it taste good, but he did. And the world is full of those small kindnesses and magnificent little treasures in life that God has given us. If that's all it is, seize on those things and recognize the goodness and that those gifts come from God and then give Him thanks. Direct that gratitude, not just to, oh, I like this. No, 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 I recognize where this came from. It is yours. Thank you for it. Because just as it is impossible to live a satisfied and happy life without gratitude, lack of gratitude leads to discontentment and despair. You ever known someone? Think of someone you know who is miserable and unhappy all the time. Have you ever heard them express thankfulness and gratitude? No, because a mind that is self-centered and focused on its own circumstances, its own situations, can never look out of itself to be thankful. But if you are looking outside of yourself to the good things and the one who provides those good things, it makes it hard to spend your time thinking all about yourself and what's wrong in your life. It's easy. <clears throat> it's easy to not be thankful whenever our time and our attention, our focus stays on the things of this world. And, and there's this temptation in our society and our culture today to kind of push aside the things of God. Those don't matter. Even people who are willing to, you know, say, well, okay, well, you have that belief and that's good for you, you know, but just you know, leave that aside. No, God is central to being satisfied and happy and thankful. Look at Romans chapter 1. In verse 20, Paul actually makes the point that God is out there and he has been seen and he can be known. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The truth is that evidence of God's power, his glory, his majesty is everywhere around us. It's the water we swim in, the air we breathe. And what's really interesting, and I know this is one of those things that the more you say it, you know, and y'all are like, we're country folk, we know. Because you see it around you all the time. Every day, the majesty and wonder of God's creation and action around you. <clears throat> so obvious is this truth. It has to be actively suppressed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Despite claims of people who say, well, you know, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't know God existed. I, did, I didn't know about whatever. Like, okay, fine, you didn't have the exact specific revelation from God, but you knew he was there. <clears throat> I like to compare it to, uh, uh, and I've used this analogy before because I think it's a really good one, a uh, speed limit sign. You're speeding along and you're flying by, you're, right, right, you're, you're, you're doing, you got your cruise control set at 75 because that's the last sign you saw. All of a sudden there's lights behind you and you know, he says, hey, where are you going in such a hurry? Speed limit's 50. 50? I didn't know. I didn't see the sign. Is he going to go, oh, okay. Well, in that case, you know, just slow down. I don't know. He might if he's in a good mood. Fact is, eh, he's probably going to write you that ticket. Why? Because there was a sign. It was about a quarter mile back. Plain as day. It's not even one of those speed traps where they let the branch grow over it so it's blocked. No, no, no. It was right there. Clear as day for you to see. Why didn't you see it? Well, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, okay. It makes you just as guilty. Well, I mean, I, I didn't realize, you know, the road's nice and straight, and I just assumed, oh, okay, well, sorry, you're just as guilty. It was right there, plain as day, to be seen by anyone who was willing to open their eyes and look at it. I didn't know is not an excuse, because you had no reason not to know. There it is, and some people don't notice or they ignore it, and often people will ignore or deny God or the things of God because there's something else in their life that they think is going to bring them happiness, bring them satisfaction, bring them contentment more than God will. Could be that maybe something they want is something that God has said, thou shalt not do that. Or maybe it's just a general pride that they don't want to be told what to do. We've mentioned before, I think I actually brought it up last week. Do you view God as the creator, sovereign over his creation, or is he an intruder into your life? Well, how dare God come and try to tell me what I should do? Well, he made you and everything about you. He designed this world you live in. Maybe he actually has some input on how it should be lived. But instead, we have pride and we have selfishness that wants to say, no, 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 not your way, God, my way. Whatever the reason is, they're denying the true source of joy in pursuit of an empty promise. Look at Romans 1.21. It says, because although they knew God, remember, it's obvious, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. People in this life are feeling lost you know, you got a mind that's filled with futile, that word futile, the idea is empty, useless, meaningless thoughts. A heart consumed that is, with, that is filled with, consumed by dark desires and wants. The answer is to acknowledge God. Because it's saying that, that God was all around them. They had every reason to know but they were not acknowledging God. First, you have to stop and you go, okay, wait a minute, it's not all about me. Maybe there's something wrong here. I know there's a God. Let me recognize him and his glory and let me give him thanks. <clears throat> Another problem when we lack thankfulness is we like to play the blame game. You ever played the blame game? Some of you are probably really good at it. Right? Those of you who have kids, the blame game isn't something you have to teach people. Well, it comes natural. You actually be taught not to play it. 
right? Rather than looking at the good things in life and thanking God for them, what we do is we look at the bad things in life and in the world, and we seek for someone or something else to blame. Look at the situation in my life. Rather than me looking at the good things in my life and being thankful for it, I'm going to look at the bad and who can I blame? When we're unhappy and we're discontent, we tend to try to find excuses. Well, it's not my fault. It must be someone else's. Sometimes there's bad things in life that happen that are outside of our control. Obsessing about those can drive you crazy. And so what was it that Paul told us back in Philippians chapter 4 that we should do instead, instead of worrying about the things outside of our control? He said, no, don't think about those bad things outside of your control. Rather, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, anything that's praiseworthy, think on those things. Oh, but you don't understand, I have that. No, no, stop, stop dwelling on that. Stop thinking about that. Think about the good things. But there's also bad things that happen that we can control. And one of the most despicable lies in our culture, in our world today, is that you can't control it. That you're just a victim of whatever happens to you. But the fact is, there are things that are within your control because God created us that way. That we are responsible, rational, thinking, free agents that can choose what we do. So, Animals typically run off of instinct. Something happens, they react. It's just programmed into their behavior. Stimulus, response. Action, reaction. But humans are different. We have a third step inserted in the middle where we have some kind of experience but then we can stop and we can think and we can reason and we consider and we make a choice and then we react. A lot of times what we do is we pretend like we don't have that middle part where we get to choose and we just go, oh, react. But you're responsible because you actually have the ability to stop and think before you act. Whenever we are not thankful and we find ourselves discontent, unsatisfied, unhappy, we will just react. Try to put that blame somewhere else. Rather than stop to think about ourselves, what we have done, what we could choose different, how we could choose different, we just react. A lot of times we react by playing in the blame game, which goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Do you remember the situation? They've, they've eaten the fruit. God created the garden, put Adam and Eve in the garden, said you can do anything you want, you can have anything you want. Just that tree over there. Don't eat that one. Satan comes along, lies to them, deceives them, tempts them. They eat from the tree. God comes down and says, Adam, did you eat from the tree? And what did Adam say? Yeah, oh, I shouldn't have. I knew I shouldn't have, but I still did. No, he goes, hey, it was the woman. Woman did it. She she, she gave it to me. So God says, well, Eve, what did you do? I don't want me. It was a serpent. A serpent lied to me. He's shifting that blame. It wasn't my fault. I'm not responsible for what I chose. It was someone else. But it's not just there. In Exodus 32, if you remember, Moses goes up onto the mountain. The Israelites freed from slavery in Egypt. They're at Mount Sinai. Moses goes up onto the mountain. He's up there a little too long, so they make the golden calf, and they're worshiping the golden calf. He comes back down, sees them worshiping the golden calf, gets mad, throws the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on it on the ground, and asks Aaron, what have you done? I left you in charge. Now they're worshiping an idol. What did you do? Verse 22 of Exodus 32. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And I said, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. I cast it in the fire and this calf came out. Aaron's in charge. Moses comes down. What happened? You know these people. They gave me the gold to put the gold in the fire. There's a calf. I don't know what happened. In 1 Samuel 15, 
against, I believe it was the Amalekites, God commanded, wipe out everything and take nothing. Destroy everything. Samuel comes along, and there's Saul victorious in the battle, and Samuel comes, and what does he see? He sees plunder and livestock. So he confronts Saul. Hey, Saul, what is going on? How come there's all this plunder? And you know what Saul's response was? Well, the Israelites kept stuff. Hold on, you're the king. You're the one in charge. Well, you know the people. I told them we're just going there to destroy everything, but they kept it. No, 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 no. You chose to let them do that. You were the king. In Matthew 27, 24, very famous. Jesus has been on trial. He comes before Pilate. Pilate interviews him and says, well, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. Does the whole thing with Barabbas. Hey, you want Jesus? You want Barabbas? They demand Barabbas. And then he's fretting over this whole thing because he, he knows Jesus has not done anything that is worthy of crucifixion. But what does he do? Verse 24 of Matthew 27. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person. You see to it. He's the governor. He's the one who holds all of the power and authority. Well, not my fault. Y'all do what y'all going to do. We like to put the blame on others when the truth is that God created us as rational, free creatures capable of moral reasoning and judgment. We choose what we do. No one makes you do something. Well, we need to understand that. No, there is no, no. You chose to do what you did. What's really interesting is there's this thing in our culture right now, in our society, that kind of has this attitude that circumstances can excuse your bad behavior. You choose to do something wrong, well, but you need to understand what they were going through. No, you don't need to understand what they're going through. They chose to do wrong. It's common for people to claim that their choice was justified or excused because of their background, their social group, or some kind of extenuating circumstance. That they didn't have a choice. It wasn't up to them. Is it right to think that our circumstances can excuse our bad behavior? That we're just a victim in all of it? I would say that that's just another version of the blame game. You ever read through Exodus 20 that has the Ten Commandments in it? Read through there and tell me if you find any exemption clauses in the Ten Commandments. Right? Thou shalt not, well, except... Depend on your circumstances, maybe you can. It's not in there. Right? You shall not steal. It says it right there. Thou shalt not steal. It belongs to someone else. It does not belong to you. You can't not take it. Well, I mean, but what if you're just really hungry? I mean, right? I mean, wait, wait. I mean, empathy people, they gotta understand some people have it hard. We've seen situations in recent months where there is a riot and looting and people, you know, barging into stores and running out with bags full of stuff, and you'd have people come out and go, well, but they're hungry. See the hard economic times? You have to understand. If only the Bible had something to tell us about this. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Man, I get it. You're hungry. Absolutely. Verse 31, yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all of the substance of his house. Because that was the punishment. That is what the law dictated. That is what was just. I understand. You're hungry. I understand. And I sympathize. I feel for you. I really do. You still didn't get to steal. Because thou shalt not steal. It was not yours to take. Your circumstances do not justify and excuse the bad behavior. How about you shall not murder? I mean, obviously there's no exemptions on that one, right? I mean, you just don't murder people. It'd be great if that one was quite so obvious as we like to think it is. I'm not trying to make any broad statement on the issue, but as many of you are aware, there's a situation going on in the Middle East. We have had protests all over in this country and other places in the world. 
And people have come out and they have said, what happened on October 7th with the killing and the kidnapping and the other things that I will not say because there are children in the room, people have actually said that violence was justified because those were people fighting against their oppressors. So it was okay for them to do that. People have actually stood up, public officials have actually stood up in public with a platform and said it was okay for them to do what they did. Their circumstances made it okay. There's a word being thrown around saying that it needs to be decolonized. You actually look into the literature, the background of that word, decolonization, necessarily involves violent retributions, killing and murdering. There's a phrase that is often being thrown around, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And whatever you think about the situation and who has rightful claim to it and who should be in charge, the fact is that phrase right there is a call for genocide against the Jews. And it's seen as, well, that's okay because they're the oppressors. They're the colonizers. They have it coming. It's justified to kill them. Even in personal situations, the Bible only allows the taking of life in self-defense. You can read through the whole thing. There's only two situations where it is justified for the taking of a life. In self-defense or in the pursuit of justice as a capital crime, someone being found guilty in a court of law. That's it. That's all that's allowed. Murder, unjustified taking of an innocent life, is never justified, ever. There are no circumstances that can make it okay. Or how about you shall not covet, right? You shouldn't be looking at what other people have and saying, I want it. It's not fair that they have it. I should have it. But yet we have an entire segment of our society whose view of justice is entirely based on envy. That someone has something and someone else doesn't. It's what so-called social justice is all about. That group A has something and group B doesn't have it and that's not fair. And they stoke envy and resentment in order to call it justice. Here's the thing. Even if someone has something and you don't, and the reason they have it is because they got it by immoral gains, it is still wrong for you to look at what they have and say, I should have it. That's a sin. Here's the thing. Several of those examples I just mentioned, people would go, oh, look at there, politics from the pulpit. Typical right-wing evangelical conservative Christian. Right? That's how you guys are. I'm not being political. None of what I just said has anything to do with politics. just picking these glaring examples from current events in our culture at present. But these are foundational, objective, moral principles. They happen to speak to some current things that are going on that might touch on politics. But I'm not talking about the politics. I'm talking about the morality of you standing there and saying, it's not fair that they have it, I should have it. No, 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 no. That's envy. That's coveting. Rather, what is our attitude supposed to be? One of thankfulness, of the good things that we do have. Fact is, though, all these different circumstances, even if they're unfair, even if they are unjust, the circumstances do not justify our choosing to sin. Human beings are free, rational creatures capable of and responsible for making good moral choices. These are things which our culture has lost sight of, things that we sorely need, things which we must always guard against forgetting. The ideas of gratitude, thankfulness, and responsibility. You are responsible for the choices that you make and the actions that you take on behalf of those choices. And responsibility is not just about who is to blame for something. Look at the word, responsibility, responsible, response, able. 
You are able to respond. You have the ability and the power within yourself to choose how you respond to a situation. You are response-able. I get it. Not everything within life is within our control. A lot of things are. But there are things that are not. And sometimes bad things happen that we cannot control. But that's sin. This is a broken, busted up, fallen, sinful, pride-filled world. And it's not going to be fixed until Jesus returns. In the meantime, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, whatever things are praiseworthy, think on those things. And as we think on those things, we remember that, as James 1.17 says, every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And we remember that despite the bad, unfair, unjust things in this life, there are those things that are good and praiseworthy. And we think on those things. We remember whom they came from, especially the gift of grace that we have received through Christ Jesus. We think on those things and we give thanks to God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who paid for our sin on the cross that we might be forgiven and reconciled back to God. Knowing that it is only a life of gratitude for those good things that we have received that can actually lead to our fulfillment, our satisfaction, and our contentment and peace in this life. And so as we prepare for Thanksgiving amidst all of the meal preparations and travel plans and whatever else that may be involved. Let us also remember the good and gracious gift that we have been given on Calvary by Jesus Christ. And let us be thankful for that wonderful day, that happy day whenever our sins were washed away. That little church on Liberty Hill, come praise the Lord. Let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty.